Would you please stand to begin the services here for Honorable Senator Deacon John L. Scott, Jr. From the Lord, which made heaven and earth, He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Behold, the Lord is my keeper.
dreams were only trusting. Even when we can't trace it, if we only trust him, he will not disappoint us. We come today deeply sad and heavy hearts because of the, the departure of our dearly beloved brother. It was more than just a member of the Ebenezer Church to be was my friend and my brother. And this is indeed a difficult day for me, for John, for the family, and so many of you. But we pray God will enable us and empower us to encourage each other in this moment today. If you would, bow your heads with me as we pray. Eternal and everlasting God, wise as you are, knowing all things, this moment that we find ourselves embracing today, none of us wanted this moment Many of us are still trying to process this loss. Lord, we know you are a God who, as you said, don't put on us no more than we can bear. And we certainly hope that is true today for John, for John, John, for Miss Gracie. strength that you can provide. We pray, God, that your presence would permeate this place, that you would reassure the hearts of those who will be burdened, broken, bleeding because of the death of God today. We know, God, that the word you gave us says that to be absent from the body is to be present with you. We believe that because, because your word says And that gives us enormous amount of comfort because we know John was a man of faith. I know personally the walk he had with you. And we're thankful and glad, God, that you allowed him to sojourn and hang around with us for these years that he's been around us. Bless our lives the way he blessed us. Show yourself strong today, Lord, in this moment of weakness. Not just for your servant, but for the people who are here today. Show yourself strong. Give us the capacity and ability to, in the midst of our pain and our sorrow, to yet give you praise and to give you glory, honoring you that you're the only God that is. And even now, we don't believe you've made a mistake. We ask you now, to hold us in the hollow of your arms. Do us as the scripture says, rock us in the bosom of Abraham. And may we know the comfort that you really do provide. It's in your son Jesus' name, the only name, we ask these things. And we count it done. And the people of God all said together, Amen. Amen. Once more and again, give God a Another big round of applause for his gracious Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to follow the services of this worshiping moment, and this is a worshiping moment. And I would remind you if you brought your uh, electronic device with you, your phone, and what have you, that you put it in a position or a mode where it does not interrupt this sacred worship experience. Put it in a position where it does not do that. And we're going to ask those persons whom uh, Joan and the family have requested to be a part of this celebration of John's life.
come forward at the time that you've been uh, placed in these order services and uh, share with us, share with us a word that will give strength to the family and put smiles on their face as we remember a great man, John L. Scott Jr. Opening hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus. For those of you who are familiar with that hymn of the church, join in and sing together. This blessed hymn of the Lord. Be led by the choir.
To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. The family has uh, selected as the Old Testament hymn of our script of meditation, Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning with verse 11. And the word of the Lord says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to do you a future and hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away. May the word of God comfort and keep you all the days of your life. chapter verses 1 through 3 and it reads let not your heart be troubled ye believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. The word of God for the people of God. <laughs> Napoleon. And I think you know what I mean by that. 
little Napoleon complex, right? And if he said it, he meant it. And he had a lot of words to say. If, if you would have heard some of our conversations, you probably wouldn't have thought that we were brothers, that we were probably enemies because they, they sounded pretty intense because I'm a pretty strong personality myself. And John, when he starts talking, and talking, and talking, <laughs> you can't tell him otherwise, right? So I would sometimes tell John, I said, John, you don't know everything. <laughs> there are some people who know some other things too, other than you, John. And he would, he would, uh, he would, he would indulge me as a big brother would to a younger brother, and we would wrangle and we would argue. And I would tell him, I'm not going to do it just because you said it. I got my own thoughts on on mine too. And I had an incident years ago, and I think this kind of summarizes it. Um, I used to work with youth, and there was a, a, a youth um, a manager of a program. And one time I walked in the building and, and, and this director, they were upstairs. There used to be a program called Coban, he used to consult with them. And I thought he was killing this kid. I mean, because he was screaming, he was stomping his feet. And I thought I was going to have to run upstairs and pull him off of the kid, right? And as I was going up the stairs, I heard him scream, I love you! And he was so passionate about this child his purpose, his future, his direction, that it caused him to be angry at a mishap that he had done. But his love and his passion, that's John. John sincerely loved District 19. I see Brother Willie out there, he loved the people to the point where he was passionate about it. And he didn't mind displaying that passion. So whenever he displayed that passion toward me, I knew it came from a place of love. We miss this brother. We are going. This is a void that I believe may not ever be filled because of his passion, his service, his commitment. He was a friend of the pastor. I want to pastor. I want to recognize the brothers from the Midlands Coalition of Churches that he tires tirelessly serve those communities. He was a politician's politician. We are going to miss John for many, many years to come. And we want the Scott family to know how much we love him, how much we love you, and how much we're still here for you, even though he's with the Lord. I said something to him as a brother, and I meant this, and I'm deliberate about this before I read this and do a closing prayer. Um, I said to John in a personal moment uh, one day, you have not gotten in the, in the hood, we say, your props. For all the work that you've done, you've not really gotten your props. We need to do something that bears your name on it in, in District 19. And there was a project and a program that he and I had agreed was something that, that, that was true to his heart too. We've worked with gangs and all kinds of things that we've done together. But there has to be something that bears the legacy and memory of John Scott in this city and in this state because his work. <laughs> I'm saying to Sister Scott, I'm saying to everyone who, who was on the side of my voice, I'm committing myself to make sure that that legacy is marked here in the city and the state of South Carolina. Amen. <laughs> From my father, Pastor Eddie Davis, who is the senior pastor of Little Zion Baptist Church, who could not be here, it reads, Words cannot fully convey the sense of loss that we feel in this moment of time. Truly, as the scriptures say, a prince has fallen in Israel. We regret that we are out of the country and unable to return before the homegoing services for this great man of God. However, it is with our deepest sympathy that my family and our church family wish to express our sincere condolences to Mr. Scott and the Scott family, the Ebenezer Baptist Church family, the City of Columbia, and the State of South Carolina Senate District 19 at the passing of our friend and brother, community leader and activist, John L. Scott. I have had the honor and pleasure of working with Senator Scott on many occasions over the years as he tirelessly served his constituency 
and indeed the state of South Carolina, and in many regards, this great nation. In my humble opinion, no greater public servant has ever graced the halls and chambers of the Senate. This great man of God will be severely missed by those of us who has been impacted by the presence of his work. Senator Scott's life epitomized what it means to be a servant leader. It has been my honor to have had the privilege to serve with him and him with me in many efforts to uplift, support, and better the lives of those in our beloved communities, city, and state. Senator Scott was a living example of what Jesus meant when he said that he that will be greatest of all must be servant of all. Because of that, I am convinced that on this past Sunday, he heard the Lord say to him, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Because you have been faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou the joy of the Lord. Though Senator John L. Scott's departure will leave a void in the life of his family and the lives of all those who benefited from his unselfish service and support throughout the state, I am persuaded that if you continue to put your trust in God, the words of the psalmist will become a reality in your life in due time. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. We will miss you, my friend, but the end, not the end. And because of that, we will meet again. Rest in peace, your friend, Pastor Eddie W. Davis, the Rosanne Baptist Church family, and the Medical Charitable Organization. Let us pray. Father, you are merciful, you're gracious, you're kind. The word declares that you pity every groan. He that watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleep. You see all, and you know all. You know the hurts, you know the voids, you know what we all feel in this moment. You know the the sense of loss everyone in this room is feeling. Send now your spirit, the comforter, the guide, the teacher. Teach us how to move past this moment. Teach us how to take the examples of John's lives, life and apply them in a meaningful way. God, guide the family, comfort the family, comfort Lady Joan, young John, and the entire family, God, as they try, God, to move past this void in their life. Teach the sinner and those who serve with him what it truly means to be a servant and how to leave a legacy, God. Teach the city how to honor God, those who serve while they live. Teach the church how to show true love the way Jesus did. Use now this man of God in this hour, God, who has the responsibility to comfort those who just don't understand. God, many of us never expected to be in this moment. But we know God that your purposes and your will, God, is greater than our thoughts and our desires. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are the ways and thoughts of God. So use God, Dr. Ross, now to convey your heart, to convey your mind, to release your spirit into this atmosphere, God, that will raise us all up to a place, God, where we will see your will. And then, God, we can all comfortably say, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And we will give you the glory even in this moment. So in the name of Jesus we pray. Let every heart say, Amen. Amen.
today as we pay tribute, just with respect and gratitude for a life well lived yeah. and great service. The Senator from Richmond, what purpose, Senator Scott, what purpose do you rise? <laughs> I miss saying that. But I said it many a time and he would go up to give a point of personal interest and I would remind him he had up to five minutes. And he said, that's all right, I'm not going to use the whole time. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'd say, Senator, your time is up. Uh, but Senator is a good man with a heart of service. He loved his constituents of District 19. And it's not lost on me today that on this day, the August 19th, we recognize and celebrate the life of the Senator from District 19. <laughs> and his love has been mentioned earlier, went to this state as well as not just focused on his district. He, he was the type of individual that he just, he cared about everybody. And he did it with great honor, respect. He did it with loyalty, with dedication. But he was also a peacemaker. Yes. He was about bringing gentleness to the situations. And he did it from a situation of also, I would say, inclusiveness. As I think back to many things that the Senator from Richland has championed, whether it's, and I'm sure we'll hear more about his dedication to education from kindergarten through higher education, it was all about including individuals to make sure that they had the opportunities for them to have a better life. He loved SC State, there's no doubt about that. But he was also very involved in workforce development and making sure that people were included in economic development, bringing people the opportunities for a brighter tomorrow, inclusiveness. He was involved with rural health care, even though his district was here in urban Richland County. One of the last things I worked with my friend, the Senator from Richland on was internet broadband service. Now you would think with them being from here and again in urban Richland and they had pockets of need for broadband, his vision and his commitment was making sure that rural South Carolina had broadband brought to their communities because of his love and his care and his compassion for other individuals and again about including people for their future to be a better future, a better opportunity for them right where they lived in rural South Carolina. I'm going to miss my friend. I'm going to miss those conversations when he would stop me in the hallway with yet another idea. <laughs> or I'm trying to sit next to him at a meeting and he always had an additional thought that he liked to share it in a side conversation. I'm gonna miss that. I will tell you that the Senate of South Carolina is gonna miss John Scott, the staff, and those, I would say, that whose life has been touched by the Senator from Richland. John Scott, he's going to be missed. There is that void that will not be replaced. But today, we give thanks to the Lord with gratitude that on our journey of life, we had the opportunity to share part of that journey with our friend, John Scott. A life of service, a life 
well lived. One that would be missed. But one that we celebrate because of the impact that he had on us for us to be better. A life that was taken from us far, far too soon. But we celebrate God giving us John Scott and to him a faithful, dedicated servant of his Lord and the citizens in this state. Well done. Well done. Thy good and faithful servant. Our blessings and our love to the Scott family. There's a sweet spirit in this place. And I know it's the spirit of the Lord. Today we've come to honor my friend and colleague, a good soldier, a general in a rank, but a foot soldier in a heart. A man who passed away on the battlefield. He was still in motion, still fighting, still working, still seeking to make this state a better place for all of his citizens. In so many respects, John Scott was the conscious of the South Carolina Senate and the General Assembly. And I would tell you, he was my seatmate. For the last six or seven years, he sat right across the aisle from me. Coincidentally, it's the same seat that Senator Pinckney sat in. It's regrettably that we'll see that black cloth on that seat. But there are times whenever you're sitting beside one another that with the commentaries with all the laws that are going on in the state, you understand human frailties. You understand their character. You understand what's going on in their life. John had no frailties. He was concerned about your family and my family. One personal story is that he loved my daughter and my children. He'd always ask me, how's the baby girl? The gentleman shakes her head, he's always baby girl. And every time he would see her, he would come and put his arms around her and greet her. And at times would give her a piece of money and tell her that he loved her. And that's the John Scott that we knew. He loved your children as well. And the work that he's done, it was for all of his children. John's greatness and success rested in his humility, his intellect, his deep commitment to his citizens and his district, and his unwavering faith in God. He seriously believed in the instruction of Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. My friend and colleague was a servant leader. And this for him was not just a campaign slogan. He worked every day to serve. He worked every day to make and Senator Scott's imprint and influence and impact are seen and felt here in Columbia and all across South Carolina. From the path-breaking South Carolina lottery, the high-speed internet, access to stronger support for historically black colleges, access to voting, early voting, school buses, and most likely Scott for jobs here in this state. John Scott left his mark. In 69 years of life, he was determined to move up the ranks. And he moved, as you'll see in this obituary, from the Richmond County Council to the House of Representatives and to the Senate, and ultimately ran for Lieutenant Governor of the State of South Carolina with my friend Marguerite Woods. In his 69 years, he moved up the ranks from the back row to the front lines. He moved from Harlem Heights to higher heights. And in each turn, John, who was a finance major, he had it with precision and determined study. He loved his number. And so I talked to you briefly about how you check those boxes. We check boxes. I'm checking boxes of how many states I can get to. But John checked his boxes for life. And so when God called a role for a successful businessman, John checked the box, set up his company, did his work, collected his cars. When God called a role for a son and family man, he talked about rabbit all the time. And his mother, 
he was legendary. I feel like I know him myself. He checked the box. When, John, when God called a role for a faithful husband, John, and a committed father, John, John, he checked that box. He says, I'll go. And John, you've been a pillar of strength in ministry for his death. You were absolutely on point with everything. God bless you. You've been a faithful wife. And John's a great husband. And as you know, when God called for a devoted church member and deacon, John checked that box too. When he called for a dogged champion for a South Carolina State Bulldogs, not to be confused with the mascot because he was a Bulldog too, John checked that box as well. And for all historical black colleges, when God called for a tireless fighter and a staunch defender of the least of these, which is all of our children, what you do it to me, you do it to them, say it to the Lord. John Scott checked the boxes for life. All the boxes. And yes, they say he was a little small in, in stature, but he was big in heart. Broad vision with limitless ideas. And today, for some that said a man was small in stature, stands as a monument before all of us. He finished the race that God set before him, and his work and impact will endure. The true meaning of life is to plant trees under which the shade you would never say it. John Scott enjoyed the victory for the shade that you said in the trees that you would set in, we would set in those trees from now on. And one last story. In John's Senate office, Stephanie, he proudly displayed photographs of his ancestors. He knew his roots back to enslavement in Fort Mott in Calhoun County. He was inspired by the people framed on his wall. And he believed that he was called by history to finish the un unfinished work of those who went before him. Now, folks, Senator Scott's work must become our own. We must finish his unfinished work. So let us pick up the mantle and run on to see what our ends will be. So today, with a grateful heart, we say Senator John Scott Servant of God, well done. Rest from thy love and employ. The battle fought, the victory won. Enjoy the master's joy. In his final prayer, maybe there we righteousness in the heart, beauty and character, harmony in every home, order in the nation, peace in the world. And on a personal note, John, friendship is essential to the soul. Thank you for being my Rest in peace, my brother. God bless you all. Turned 15. 
because he was always missing school bus. But when Josh started making some money, he put real cars together. He flipped more cars than he flipped houses, no joke. John was a competitor in his young days. He could outshoot anybody with his marbles. If you came around him with a pocket of mar full of marbles, you left with the one you were shooting with. <laughs> he also used his marbles to break out the window panes in the doors around the house and cut lights off when you messed with him. He had a short temper, which led to all the fighting when he was younger, but eventually he grew out of that. John worked since the age of 12. He actually ran the family store before going to school each morning and was always the last one to leave the house, but never late to school. He was so short, he had to stand on a step stool to run the cash register in the school. But no one dared tease him, because Timber would flare up and show up. <laughs> Business was always a part of John's DNA. John worked all of his life, helping people in all walks of life. No matter where you came from, if he could help you, he would. When John went to college, he thought he was in another world. No store to attend, freedom from family, headaches, no neighborhood brawls, and no one to tell him what to do. He was on the wrestling team there. He joined the Persian Rifles, met lots of long-term friends, to include Joan, or Miss Jo, as he called her. They married, and then came little John John. With his accounting degree and working for state government, he became a broker. Stanis Jail Scott Lucy, and the rest is history. I am John's baby sister, as some of you may know. I do have a birth name of Linda, but since my birth, John always called me his baby sister, or my baby. No matter who he introduced me to, I was introduced as his baby sister. John, affectionately known as Junior, Lee, or Uncle Lee, not only was he my big brother, but my senator, my mentor, my real estate broker, my spiritual advisor, my peacemaker, my protector, my family leader, my friend, and my boss. We worked together as real estate office for over 30 years. John was always teaching and advising me on ways to do business the right way. John was not the one for holding your hand. If he, could, he would give instructions on how to do something, but it was up to you to make it happen. He would say, you're smart, you can do it, figure it out. Call me if you need help. But before I could call him, he ended up calling me to see if I got it straight. He was just that kind of person, firm, but loving and considerate at the same time. This was his way of making me become more independent and not be afraid to face obstacles in my life. Mission accomplished, my brother. John was so giving him himself. He made sure everyone in our family was taken care of. John helped all of us. No matter what the need was, he would say, let me see what I could do. John was compassionate, competitive, Controlling at times, but warm-hearted and loving. Uh, you couldn't ask for a better family man, friend, father, or brother who was funny and liked to tell his little jokes to make you smile. But on last Saturday, last Sunday, August 13th, which was my birthday, John had an appointment to keep with God, one that he couldn't cancel, he couldn't change the time, and he couldn't be late. God decided that John needed to rest because his assignment here was completed. A servant of God, well done. Thank you, God, for giving me, my sisters and brothers, an awesome brother, and my mom and dad an amazing son. John's life and legacy will forever shine bright in my life and your life. Thank you all for the love and support you have given our brother, Senator John L. Scott, Jr. Over the many years that he served the city, the county, and the state, I pray that his service to you and to the state of South Carolina was acceptable because we know it will be unforgettable. Sleep on, my brother, and take your place among the heavenly dignitaries. Your family will forever love you, and we will miss you so, so much. I love you, your baby sister.
established. But as a minister of the gospel, I have to say God be the glory in all that he has done to the members of clergy here, distinguished elected officials, including two governors, the former governor and the current governor of the state of South Carolina, to my former colleagues in the House and the Senate uh, who are here, to all the other electors that are here as well, and to the beloved family of my dear friend, and brother John L. Scott. Now, I'm going to be short, but of course, being a minister and a politician, you know that's going to be challenging. But I got to say that uh, a lot was said yesterday about John Scott. But I want to give you a, a perspective from him. As someone who met John some 40 years ago in an office, at the realty company that you just heard the sister talk about. I was in there because I was there along with a gentleman by the name of Ladder Thomas. And we were meeting there with a gentleman by the name of Kenneth Mosley who was running for Congress. And he wanted us to meet the Richland County Coordinator that he had selected. And that person was this young man that who talked a lot, talked more than I did, and his name was John Scott. And from that relationship, from that day, uh, we bonded and formed a relationship and found out that we had so much in common. We were both wrestlers. We were wrestlers in high school. He wrestled in college. Of course, I got to state. I started wrestling, and I decided I needed to find something else to do. Um, we found out we loved family. John was a, a, a figure that always led. And, and so we found out that we had much in common because we loved people and we loved politics. The last time I spoke to John, matter of fact, on August the 4th at 12.30 p.m., we were to have lunch with my colleague and good friend, the other part of the crew, Leon Howard. And if you know that John was always the one that wanted to make the decision to be in charge. So John picks out Jasmine's and said, we'll meet you there, Senator uh, Patterson. And guess who calls up and says, well, I'm busy. I got a meeting over in the Senate. Y'all go ahead. John picks up, uh, uh, picks up the restaurant and he stands and Leon and I up. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny because he truly you know, we served in the house together uh, for a number of years, for, for, for many, many years. Uh, but when John got elected to the Senate, uh, things sort of changed. He let us know definitely which one was the higher chamber. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, we always had this competition in terms of who would pass or introduce meaningful legislation to pass. But to make my point, and, and, and I'll, I'll be very brief, he was an extraordinary visionary, a strategic thinker who always had a plan. And he was always well prepared, putting in the time and the work. In fact, one of John's pet peeves was, and I know you've heard this before, he don't do no work. You see, he had a very low tolerance for people not doing what they thought they were supposed that he thought that they were supposed to be doing and not showing up for the battle. He was truly a servant leader, an extraordinary visionary whose legislative accomplishments speak for themselves. And I just want to highlight a few that may have been overlooked last night. And I won't be redundant of the ones that were mentioned here. But I want to focus on one that we all see every day and that shows up in the budget of the state of South Carolina. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there would be no lottery in the state of South Carolina if it were not for John L. Scott. And I'm gonna tell you how that happened. John knew the rules. 
better than any one of us in the house at the time. And we caught them napping on the floor, and John brought the legislation forward that gave us the enabling legislation for the lottery. Put it up for a vote. And by, if I'm not, I stand to be corrected, maybe three votes, that's how close it was. We were able to get the lottery legislation up, and of course, eventually, it passed uh, with the enabling legislation. South Carolina State University uh, was initially left out of $30 million that were earmarked for research institutions went to Carolina, Clemson, and USC. John L. Scott and I, along with the speaker at that time of the House, John insisted and we worked it out where South Carolina State to this day receives $2.5 million special appropriation. Now, I, I got to close on two festive notes, because everybody talks about John's tenacity. I've only seen John frightened, but once in my lifetime, Joy Preston had invited us up to Anderson to the Balloon Festival. <laughs> True story. And they flew John and I to get up in the balloon. Joe knows what I'm talking about. We got up into that hot air balloon. I'd never been in one in my life, and, I, he, and neither had he. And we floating across, all across, the, across Anderson County. And for some reason, the landing didn't work out quite <laughs> as good as the takeoff. That's the only time I saw John get quiet. <laughs> but. I think I was feeling kind of like he was, so I didn't take advantage and try to out-talk him. <laughs> I'm going to conclude with this, and I, I want to leave this, and we talked about, you heard some individuals share about legacy. You know, in Ezekiel, the 22nd chapter, and the 20th verse, the Word of God says that I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the game. On behalf of the land, so I, I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. We've heard that before. But there is an added meaning to that when you look at it within the context. John Scott, just like many of us sitting in this room, had an opportunity because God has a plan for everybody in here. And he was willing to answer the call and stand in the gap. And it didn't matter whether you were black or white or whether you were Republican or Democrat. It were, if it was for right, John Scott was for it. And so, my brothers and sisters, and I say that to all as part of his legacy, as a loving son, and you can see where he gets that love from in terms of his dear mother, his loving wife, he could have picked a better partner. His son, John John, who's, John John, I'm here for you, man. To his godchildren, he has a goddaughter and a godson, and I'm proud to say that Gabrielle is his goddaughter. Loves him dearly. To his family. And if you really want to know John, see how, it, it, you really have to get a sense of how close he was to his siblings and how beautiful they are in terms of what each other. His legacy is that he lived not only a life that was well lived, but one that was committed to service. And so I submit to you, let us stand by those same ideas. Let us reach across the aisle. Let us work together and do what John did to make this a better place, a better world for all of us. Thank you, and may God bless you.
with proper protocol we establish our greeting today with a heavy heart as we come to celebrate the life of Senator John L. Scott. When I received a call from Lady Scott, who referred to John as Lady Scott, I think you all should do the same as well because she certainly deserved that, that time. I'll give her a round of applause. Sunday morning that I should come to Charleston to say goodbye to my friend, uh, Senator Scott. It was hard to believe. It was so painful. And obviously, when we're in deep pain, we go to the Lord. And I thought about Bible verses, Exodus chapter 4, when the Lord gave Moses a charge. Moses was apprehensive. He even suggested to God that he reach out to his brother Aaron, the ambition, who was more of a fluent speaker. The Lord said to Moses, Isn't it I, the Lord, that determine if one see or not see? Isn't it I, the Lord, that determine if one hear or not hear? Isn't it I, the Lord, that determine if one speak or not speak? So go, Moses, and speak to the people, for I will speak to you. Today, my brothers and sisters, I pray to God that he give me the strength to adequately describe my friend, Senator John Scott. Senator Scott and I knew each other approximately 40 years. Every night between 11 and 11.30, regardless of where we were, out of town, in town, he would call me, I would call him. We've known each other so long and to Lady Scott would ask the phone and said, hold on, Leon, I get it. <laughs> now, that was before Call ID. <laughs> she knew what was <laughs> But uh, John and I shared a lot of time together. Before we were blessed with all these sophisticated titles, we were still friends. We were friends before that time. We grew up in the same community, went to the same high school. We supported each other in good times and bad times. And we were always there for each other in good times and bad times, even in Charleston on Sunday. At the final, we were together. Uh, Senator Scott cared about people. He bossed a uh, uh, councilwoman, Gresham, for the last year. But who we going to get the bosses around now? And Senator Scott's not here. But uh, uh, Senator described cared about people so much. And he took charge. He constantly talked to me about my health, my finance, when we go to dinner. Uh, when he ordered, he ordered for me, I'll give him some baked chicken and some tempers. <laughs> <laughs> I said, man, I don't want baked chicken to I want fried chicken. Well, you need to get off some of that weight, man. <laughs> How's your cholesterol? How's your A1C? It's fine, it's okay. That's, <laughs> that's because he cared about people. And, you know, and he was always giving you advice all the time. Even when we were much younger, and so the guy got out of college, he bought real estate. I bought a new car. <laughs> and so about three weeks ago, we was discussing that, he was telling me the fruit of that real estate that he bought. How that real estate he bought just out of college was treating him so good. So he said, tell me about that new car you bought. <laughs> I said, man, I don't know where, I don't know where it's at. <laughs> and finally, you know, the Senate and the House had this arrival. And we were, um, friendly rounds. And uh, I would go, and he, at night when we talk, he'll say, son, tell me what y'all messed up today. <laughs> um, we'll, we, we, we'll straighten it out. We, don't worry about it, we'll straighten it out. But uh, again, I want to thank Lady Scott um, and her family, John John, for this opportunity. Thank God for the friendship. Thank God for the time that he allowed Senator Scott to be with us. You know, all our hearts are broken, but the Senator did not belong to us, he belonged to God. 
And, and when, when, when someone lets you use something that does not belong to you for some period of time, you have to thank them for it. And we thank God that he placed such a spot in our community as a part of us. May God continue to bless all of you. Thank you. To the Scott family, Ms. Jones, protocol has been established, and I know many of you are looking at me as if to say, she's a new kid on the block, how in the world did she get up here? Um, and I'm indeed the new kid on the block. But before I came to county council, I had a senator. And even in college, I would stand and watch him move throughout Richland County and have a great impact. And I was so very fortunate to be able to run for office and then he was indeed my true senator. He was my senator. And I wanna be real clear today, this is not political for me. This is really personal. It's extremely personal because Senator not only took time with me and my children during some of the most difficult times, he has been there for us the entire time. And he, many people talk about the phone calls that he made. I would think that we had probably 50 interrupted phone calls a day because it would be he called, I went from being the little young girl in the back to Gresh, that's what he called me. And he'd say, Gresh, hold a minute. I'll call you right back. <laughs> and that would go on all day long. And in between those phone calls, Deacon Bryant would call. Because we had a job to do. We had to work. We had to stay moving. That was his thing. We had to stay moving. And so in the next few moments, I just want to share personal moments about who my senator, he will always be, I never called him John because I respected him in the position that he held. Uh, my son, my youngest son, Hilton, we call him Prez, we were at a community event one time and somebody came up to him and said, uh, John, so-and-so, and he looked around. And, he's, and he said, I'm talking to you. And he said, no, you're not talking to me because my first name is Senator and my last name is Scott. <laughs> and that's the person, that's, that's my Senator. And uh, it, it's always been one of those times where a uh, Senator would simply just be, uh, I, he, I would have to say I do the most, I do a lot. But uh, Team 19, which is comprised of other elected officials, he brought us together and said, if we get together, we can really impact people. And Team 19, we were planning the event, and we all were trying to keep it really simple, really small, and he would say, nope, we need a kid's call, because the baby's gotta have somewhere to play. And then he would say, and we gotta feed the people. You can't just have, invite people to your house and, and not give them something good to eat. And then it would go on and on, and before we knew it, it was, it was this huge event. But, and that was because he was so thoughtful. He always thought about people, and he put people first. And there was no guesswork with him. You knew exactly where he stood, and he would tell me, he says, Grish, I walk tall with a big stick. And there was no guess. He worked really hard. He made sure that we all had what we needed when we needed it. This is a great man. A great man. How many of us can actually say that we lived in the same community that we had the opportunity to work for? And growing up, he said that he would grow up and say, you know, I don't know why they won't fix these streets and why they won't do this and why they won't do that. And he 
had the opportunity to see the things that as a child that he saw that was wrong, he had the opportunity to fix those in, the, in Harlem Heights and in Meadow Lakes. He had that chance. That's my senator. And so a funny story, a week before my oldest son graduated, you know, boys will be boys. And they were really being boys that day. And I hear this big bump. And then they all, and then it was really quiet. I come out of my room, and there is a huge hole in the wall. And of course, as most people would do, I got to screaming, and I got to fussing. And it was as if Senator knew, because my phone rang. And, and I go get my phone in the midst of all this fussing. And he says, Grish, what's wrong with you? I said, these boys have put a hole in the wall. And he said, well, what were they doing? And I'm telling him the story. He's laughing and laughing and laughing. I said, Senator, this is not funny. Graduation is next week. We have a party. We have all this. He said, what else did they break? I said, that's it. He said, OK. Well, you OK then, right? I said, no, we still have a hole in the wall. And he said, don't worry about it. I'm going to send so-and-so over there, and he'll fix it for you. And that is my senator. You know, um, I was cleaning off my desk the other day because I just needed something else to do, something else to think about. And in cleaning off my desk, I ran across the Father's Day card that I had purchased for him. And we had given him his gift, and I said, I forgot the card at home. He said, I got my gift. You keep the card. <laughs> <laughs> but little did I know, Little did I know that this card would be one of the last things that I would have to give to him and cherish to him. And so I just want to read a little piece in this card and the note that I wrote to him. And the inside of the card it reads, you're a man who guides, inspires, loves, and it makes all the difference to everyone who knows you. And my note reads, Senator, it's hard to believe that life has come full circle where I go from standing in the back of the room where you didn't even know me to a mentor and now a father figure for me and a grandfather figure for my children. The boys couldn't ask for a better playmate and I couldn't ask for a better friend and father. You mean the world to us. And so on this day when many people are celebrating dads, we celebrate you as a father to me and the big papa for the bear boys. We love you, Gresh, Jay, and Prince. Thank you. But it's easier, much easier, to talk to a judge or to talk to a jury or a client than to come before all of these friends and family and dignitaries and talk about something you loved. So uncharacteristically for me, I've written my remarks today because I was afraid I wouldn't be able to deliver them with that crime. So if you'll forgive me, I'll start down the path and do the best I can. Five years ago, John Scott and I made some political history in this state. For the first time ever, a black man and a white woman were on the same ticket for a political office, governor and lieutenant governor. It was a point of great pride for both of us as we campaigned to stand next to each other so folks could see what diversity looked like. We thought we were proud 
We were proud. And we thought that we were powerful. We were powerful. And we had a message to deliver. And we delivered it. Now, we wanted Governor McMaster's job, let's be clear. <laughs> But I know I speak for the family, for the friends, and for John himself when I say he would be honored by your presence and the presence of the First Lady here today. Thank you for being here. <laughs> well, John and I campaigned around the state and we visited a lot of churches. We came here, we came to New Ebenezer, and I don't know how many times we were at Word of God. But we were always a team. And I was a neophyte politician, of course. He was a pro. And sometimes I was a little nervous, and he would say to me, don't worry, you've got this, they're gonna love you. And when he said that in about the 10th church, I finally turned to him and I said, John, I grew up in the Baptist church. I got this here. <laughs> and so, and so we did. Last Sunday, I was there in Charleston when he took his last breath. I stood beside my, my friend for the last time. He didn't say anything to me. But I spent this last week thinking about what he would have said if he'd spoken before he passed. And I thought about what he would want me to say to you in his memory as well. I know I think what he would have said to me if he'd spoken. He would have said, Marguerite, remember the story of Lot's wife. Now John, as we've heard this morning, was a, what should we say, spunky politician. But he hated the rancor of the current political situation. And he would say to me, if he'd spoken, he would say, keep your eyes ahead. Keep your high eyes on what we need to do and don't look back. Because if you look back in hatred and fear, you will freeze. And we have too much work to do for the people in this state to look back now. And he would say, I think, to all of you, as you look ahead and move forward in helping folks, remember the second commandment. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Whether we're politicians, whether we're churchgoers, whether we're Christians, whoever we are, the second great commandment is what we must live by. And that is what John Scott did. We've heard it this morning, all he did for the folks who were poorer and less educated the folks who were weaker, the folks who needed the help. He had a heart of service and a heart to help his neighbors. Now, for 30 years, John worked tirelessly. We've heard about that this morning. He was my great friend. But he was, in every way, a great man. Our journey together was simply a footnote in the history of this great state. But his journey, his life's work, was a walk with the angels. And so as I stand here today, side by side with my friend, I say to him, don't worry, you got this. They're gonna love you. to a team meeting, I'm going to stand up. Especially when it's sitting this long. <laughs> John, I don't know why you take me to go last. Everything about John has been, been said except trips. 
instead of riding on a camel and getting you to get up on top of it. <laughs> John is my friend. No, he's my brother. Uh, surrogate father to my kids. I know John knows me because John took his convertible and rode uh, my daughter uh, to her wedding. John drove all the way to North Carolina to a little church called Fry's Chapel Baptist Church for Mama's funeral. And John came back up a year later for Wilma's grandparents who raised her. He went to the hospital in North Carolina, not in his district, not at our church. Uh, John, when I was at a track meet at the Olympic Games, I got a call, and it was from John. My wife was in the hospital. John was there. I was a little shocked, and a little hurt, and so was Will and I. Because John calls us uh, when it's time for, a, for the prayer group. When one of our family members is sick, or something's going with John John, or CJ, or we call the prayer group together. We healed. We've been on our knees for a lot of New Ebenezer. We've been on our knees for a lot of bills that you go to. Uh, and we pray. So John called us and said, John's sick. Well, the woman I didn't get it. She said, he's real sick. That's, that's on, I think we might have been first, she called. So we said, we're going to pray. He's going to be all right. Don't you worry. John, we'll get him. We'll call him. And she said, no, John's sick. So we just, then we'll pray. And then we call 92-year-old uh, mother-in-law. Because we call people who can get the prayer up.
I'm going to tell you what. I know greatness. And some of y'all been in the presence of greatness. God puts us in, in those presence. Sometimes it becomes jealous. It becomes envy. And we will miss it. I have to tell people on my team that you know, they've been around greatness. The sadness is we'll miss an opportunity by having envy. We missed a chance to do something spectacular. John told me before Obama got elected that he'd have to be, he'd have to get through South Carolina. And then when he told me the next one, the next president's got to get through South Carolina. This is a Democrat in a Republican state. He was a fortuitous thinker. He invested in you. And the reason he was invested in a guy in Saudi Arabia, it was somewhere John, just like he invested in a painter, just to cause a uh, person to put the roof on my house, or the person, the doctor that would work on my wife. John knew somebody that was a uh, was a sheriff in a small county when I got a ticket. <laughs> he had a plan for the guy in Saudi Arabia. He did. He was going to be able to pick a phone call up because one of his constituents, one of his friends, was going to have an accident. And lo and behold, the St. Louis team track coach was riding over a, in a dune buggy, driving himself in, in Doha. The dune buggy turned over. Broke his back and punched his spine, a 75 year old guy. You know, the people in Doha paid for the hospital stay for four months and flew him back to America. So I'm going to tell you what the influence of people who serve people and make connections for the constituents. Love. So I. And, oh, I'm sorry. You told me I had to. You said, you said my pastor don't like his, uh, us going past two minutes when he told us to. <laughs> the deacons on the road with me, they already hunched me. And uh, one of them already did this. That's my wife's over there so she can't. <laughs> now it's your turn. Tink. Our ankle leg. He ain't gonna be able to run today, and we gotta get another ankle. Somebody else in here We've got an ankle. South Carolina needs an ankle. The United States of America, it needs an ankle. Our John was a leadoff for me early. He got out fast. He calmed down on the back stretch as he's running his race. He checked things out. He made sure the competition was in position. On the curve, he picked the pace up in his life. He moved on up. And then he got on his final leg. He was in a, a bad spot on the final leg. But I didn't have no doubt. Because he is, he, he loved the gospel. He was a servant. And he ain't mind talking to him in Saudi Arabia about his Savior, Jesus. Yeah. He didn't mind using the family. He didn't mind using the word Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, right now, we need a comfort. Yeah. Would you go to the Father and tell him that we hurt him? Yeah. And we need to comfort the family. Yeah. Come on, this family, yeah. and be our brother. Yeah. I want to let you know that my friend John, is all right. But you gotta say with me, if it's to be, if it's to be, if it's to be, to change America, if it's to be, if it's to be, it's up to me. You take responsibility. If it's to be, it's up to me. Say it, if it's to be, I can see your mouth. If it's to be,
and that song went up. Senator Scott would not allow us to sit. <laughs> too many to number or to name at this time. So I will call the names of a few. The New Ebenezer Baptist Church, Bible Way Church in Atlas Road, all of the churches who sent resolutions and proclamations. The C.A. Johnson High School Class of 1971. The South Carolina State University Class of 1975.
shepherd of this, this great congregation, Elder Darrell Jackson, in his absence, and the Bible Church family, for their hospitality, for their opening up and accommodating uh, the Scott family, all their facilities, for this honorable service today. Let's give him, his lovely wife, the Bible A. Trish family, his brother who is here with us tonight, this morning, this afternoon, assisting us today. Let's give them a big, big round of applause and thank you. We could not have done this without their support. We appreciate the Bible Way Church. We appreciate the Bible Way Church. To, to my wife, to all the other ministers and if they're priests and other clergy that are here today, their spouses, we recognize you. And let us recognize the chieftain of this state of South Carolina, Governor McMaster and his wife. All they are. I believe we also have former Governor Hodges that is here. Uh, all the other elected uh, officials from the General Assembly and the Senate, uh, other statewide elected officers, county officers, elected officials, city officers, elected officials, and anyone else that's uh, big wheels. We want to recognize you too. Amen. And certainly want to thank God for the New Ebenezer Church family. I want to ask the Ebenezer Church family just to stand, those that are here today. We thank you for coming and supporting John and the Scott family. We thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have truly, truly enjoyed this worshiping experience today. It is a fitting tribute for a man that deserves this kind of recognition and this kind of celebration. We have truly enjoyed this choir today. And by the way, I mean, they just, they just first class over here. They do everything first class. And I was saying to Pastor Jackson's brother, I said, now why is it that God is so unfair? He gave y'all all these great singers over here. I mean, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous they got so many great singers. Over here, by the way, amen. Truly, truly been blessed to be here and be a part of this celebration. John and I were extremely close, extremely close. And I've been wrestling with this uh, this day all week long, all week long. I've been wrestling with this moment of how I can speak to you uh, about this man that I love dearly and his lovely wife. Just the Scott family. I love them dearly. Such great people. And uh, so many wonderful things that have been said. So, so true about John. Um, now, I'm going to be very personal uh, today. I'm going to be very personal today. In fact, in fact, in case you didn't know this, the word eulogy, which is what we usually associate with these moments, we ask uh, that uh, someone give a eulogy for someone who has passed away. Well, that's the English word, eulogy, it's the English word, but it comes from the Greek word, eulogitos, eulogitos. And what has actually happened is the word eulogitos has been actually transliterated to our English word. It's the equivalence in terms of ladders and alphabet to our English word. And that word, generally, when you find it in your Bible, you don't see the word eulogy for eulogitos in Greek. You usually see, in most translations, the word blessed. The word blessed in English is the word eulogitos in Greek. And generally, when you see it in your Bible, if it's not blessed, it will say praise. Sheriff sure, Rob, it will say praise. And that word usually in your Bible is exclusively associated with God. Stay with me if you will. It is usually associated with God. And what that means, Governor, that means that you and I ought to say something good about God. Because the word eulogitos literally means say a good word. 
somebody ought to have no problem saying a good word about God. So that word usually is confined to God. But there are a few instances because of what we know about the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament to the New Testament. Can I teach a minute if you don't mind? It is, it is found in a few instances associated with man. And so what I want to do in keeping with what the word means biblically, I want to say a good word about this man. I want to say a good word about this man, John L. Scott. So I ask for your prayers as we uh, share briefly. Maybe I should modify that because I might not be that brief. <laughs> I'm so used to saying that because over the 30 some years I've been preaching eulogy slash words of comfort. I generally say to people, I won't be long. And most of the people that believe it know that means 15 minutes or less. But today, it might be a little bit longer. I just thought I'd tell you that for the truth. It's a little personal. You understand? So this is your prayers and your amen as we share briefly uh, with you from, from the uh, from the Lord's word. You are my strength, strength like no other, strength like no other, reaches to me. You are my strength, strength like no other, strength like no other, reaches to me. You are
here's what I want to talk about for just a moment. I want to talk about my go-to man. My go-to man. That's what John was. He was my go-to man. One of the local newspapers, journalists called me this past week and asked if I would share my thoughts about John's faith work in the church. I shared with her what man of deep faith John Scott was. Not many years after I arrived here in Columbia to become pastor of the New Ebenezer Church, I was persuaded, I was convinced that John took his relationship with God extremely seriously. So I approached John and around the year I believe 2000, uh, 2005, to inform him that I was considering and wanted to recommend to the church that he be ordained as a deacon in the Ebenezer Church. He said, Doc, I'm extremely honored that you would consider me becoming a deacon in this church. And it's a decision, I must say to you, I have not regretted, even up until this very moment, that John Scott became a deacon in the Ebenezer Church. John Scott, in case some of you may not realize it, he actually was more comfortable being referred to, a heap of, he, he being re referred to, or identified as Deacon John Scott, more so than being Senator John Scott. His faith and his relationship with God meant that much to him. I noticed that he had a thirst and a hunger for the Word of God, studying the Word of God, wanting to know more about what certain passages meant. He would often call me and converse with me about certain passages that he was reading and studying and wanted to get my opinion about it, my thoughts about it. Because John believed in, in God, and he not just believed in God, but he pursued God, which is not what a whole lot of people do. He pursued it with a passion, wanting to know more about God, and wanting to even be closer to it brought John tremendous amount of satisfaction just to be a servant. Not just serving in the Ebenezer Church, but serving the constituents in his district. As many of you have already mentioned and you already allotted to in your remarks about him. John got tremendous amount of pleasure in knowing that he had done something in that district to lessen the stress and anxiety of the people of, of his district by some initiative that he had proposed, by some legislation that he had sought to get approved and passed. John enjoyed doing things to help people in his role as not just a deacon but certainly as as a senator. He worked tirelessly to bring goods and services to the people, not just in District 19, but in this state of South Carolina. He worked tirelessly. He truly advocated for the least of these by the policy that John was proposing, always trying to lift someone up to the next level, socially and economically. That's the kind of person I remember in John Scott. Being a servant, I believe, was in his DNA. He would go the extra mile at his own expense. Did you hear me? I said he would go the extra mile at his own expense. 
You see, a sacrifice to John was never a sacrifice. It was a service rendered with humility and honor. Now I suspect there are countless stories in this sanctuary today of individuals, groups, organizations, and institutions about services that John rendered on your behalf. The fact that you're here speaks volumes to the fact that your life has been impacted in a good way by the work and the service that John L. Scott did on your behalf. Because he was not just, obviously, my go-to man, but many of you in here saw him as your go-to man. John got things done. That's why you kept on re-electing him turn after turn. It's because John got things done on your behalf. Now I must tell you, I'm a sports fan. And I really enjoy watching all sports, but I specifically and especially like the NBA. I like the NBA. And here's what I like most about the NBA. is when they have that moment in the game, that moment in the game, when the game is on the line. I like that moment. It's the end of the game. Three seconds left on the clock. Somebody know what I'm talking about. And the score is either tied or it is. It's the end of the game. Three seconds left on the clock. Somebody know what I'm talking about. And the score is either tied or it is separated by a one goal shot. They may be down by just two points or one point, but you got three seconds left in the game. And the coach only has one timeout left. So he calls his timeout and he brings the team over to the side of the court and he has a conversation with them and start writing on a board. He's already decided, he's already determined who he wants to have the ball. Somebody know what I'm talking about. You've seen that kind of game. You've seen that kind of game where not only the coach has this kind of confidence, but even the teammates got this kind of confidence. And they are, they are not jealous. They're not envy of the star player who they know everybody wants him to have the ball in the last play of the game. Three seconds left on the clock and the game is on the line. Somebody used to watch him play. Somebody used to watch him play. He, went, he played for the Chicago Bulls. Somebody seen him do this more than one time. That's how he earned the reputation of being the go-to man. Because when the game is on the line, when you need a winning basket, you don't put that ball in anybody's hand. You put that ball in the go-to man's hand. That's what I saw in John Scott as his pastor of New Ebenezer Baptist Church. When something major and significant needed to be done, I gave that assignment. I knew who I had to go to to get things done. It was John L. Scott. Now, since I'm a, since I'm a, a black Baptist preacher, that's what I am. <laughs> Stay with me now, Stay with me. And since I've been doing this, since I was a teenager, which is a long time, I got three simple things to say about the go-to man, my go-to man, John Scott. Here it is. Here it is, simple as, as this. If you're going to be a go-to man, the very first and most important quality or characteristic is you got to be reliable. Hmm? You have got to prove that you can be dependable because when my back is up against the wall, 
when uh, I need assistance and I need help and I need it like right now. I need to be able to turn to somebody who I can know will be available and I know I can depend on. That happens to be John L. Scott. I want to tell you there are things that we have accomplished in the 30 years that I've been at Ebenezer that we would not have accomplished it if I didn't have John Scott that I could turn to. We are now owners of over 100 acres of land 100 acres of land off of Interstate 20. Because I came to John Scott some years ago and said to him, John, I believe that uh, the Lord is leading me to lead us to sell our property downtown and relocate somewhere else. He always referred to me as Doc. He said, well, Doc, if the Lord is talking to you, whatever it is, I'm here with you. And I'm going to do all I can to make it happen. He just let me know when, you, when you've seen the property that you're interested in. I located some property. I went to John. John said, Doc, I'll handle it from here. And do you not know, it happened to be that John had a relationship with the owner of the property. <laughs> and worked out a sweetheart deal for us to own a hundred acres of land that's got water and sewage already on it. John worked that out. He did that for New Ebenezer Baptist Church. You hear me? And I can't tell you about other things that needed to be done in relation to city, codes, and, and guidelines that John was very knowledgeable about and, and how to get things done with the city and the county and the state. That when I needed something done or, or needed to get something approved, I knew who I should call on as the go-to man and one who I knew was reliable and get it done. It happened to be John L. Scott. John was a reliable man, not just in terms of his role as a senator and, and knowing people and being able to make phone calls and get things done, but he was reliable as a deacon. John knew how to pray and was never ashamed nor afraid to pray when asked to pray. Did you hear what I said? John was a faithful worshiper on Sunday morning. He didn't just come every now and then. It had to be something that would, that, that would pull him away from his responsibilities to worship and be a deacon. For John not to be in church on Sunday mornings, in Sunday school, learning the Bible on Sunday mornings. I'm telling you about a man who had a deep faith and relationship with Jesus, financially supported the church. One who visited, as you already heard, visited the sick. John's, John, like other deacons of our church, they are uh, assigned a certain number of families that they are to minister to and oversee. And John fulfilled his responsibility to those families. He would visit the sick in the hospital, pray with them, give them some counseling and advice. Because John was a reliable deacon. Tended training and workshops on how to be a better deacon. Lord help me, Jesus. I want to tell you this man was a reliable servant. He wasn't just one who talked the talk and not walked the walk. He didn't, just have the, he didn't just have the position and name only. But John was actively involved in the life of our church as a deacon slash senator. Thank God for a go-to man that is reliable. But not only was he reliable, he was resourceful. John brought something to the table. See, there's a whole lot of people who, who are, yes, they might be available, and in some degree, they may even be dependable, but they don't bring nothing to the table. They can't help you solve no problems. I wish I had somebody know what I'm talking about. They empty, they ain't got nothing. But John always brought something to the table. I was so amazed that this man knew seemed like everybody. 
he didn't just know, you know, uh, people in administrative part of the state and the county. But listen, if you had some issue at your house, he knew a carpenter. He knew a painter. Somebody talk back to me. John knew mechanics to work on your car. And get this. I was trying to get a car for my daughter when she finished high school going off to college. And, and John, John said, Doc, I can help you with that. John knew how to get you a car and get a good deal on the car. I'm trying to tell you the man was resourceful. He knew everybody. Painters. He knew everybody who could help you get things done that you needed done. One time, a couple of years ago, uh, Carol and I had filled out our state and federal taxes. And we were expecting to get some money back, y'all, from the state. <laughs> Until we got this letter in the mail, Governor, <laughs> that said, your wife skipped a year and didn't file taxes in South Carolina for a year, and so she's in violation of that year, and they end up garnishing my wife's check for that amount that they had calculated that she owed because she skipped a year. The problem was that my wife, yes, did skip a year. They had that right. But that's because she took a job in Georgia and she was living and working in Georgia that year. She had lived in South Carolina. Then she moved to Georgia and worked in Georgia for a year. So that's why she had skipped the year. So, so you know what I did, don't you? I called John. I ain't making this up. I called John. He said, calm down, doc. I said, I'm the one that need to be calmed down. You need to calm down the first lady. They took her money. That's the one you need to be calming down. He said, doc, I got it. He said, hold on, doc. Somebody going to call you. And do you not know? In about less than 30 minutes, some big wheel from the State Department of the Revenue call me and said, Senator John Scott has just told me what your situation is and we are going to handle it. Do you not know that thing was fixed in two and two? My wife got her money back. John Scott did that. He did it. He didn't break no laws. He did it. He didn't break no laws. He did it. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, he was a resourceful. He brought something to the table. And he used his skills, his, his talents, his, his connections to bring a resolution to not just the problems I face personally and my church face, but many of you in the, in the district where he served. He brought all of that to bear because he believed in service and he did all he can to uplift people. That's the kind of person John was. Resourceful and reliable. But lastly, he was, to me, a remarkable man because he's a man of character. He was a man of decency, a man of honesty. That's the John Scott that I knew. A man who indeed embodies the essence of the character of our Savior himself. In fact, you may not have paid no attention to this, or you may not have studied this to the extent that I have today. But the name John, the name John, Johannes in Greek, the name John. Do you know what that means? It literally means this, the God who is gracious in his giving. 
The name John means one who is gracious, a gracious giver. And God knows he was that. He was a giver. He was a giver and just kept on giving. This is very personal. And I hope I don't become emotional when I tell you this. Because I was on the receiving end of his gracious giving for over 30 years. When I went through a divorce some years ago, as all divorces are, there's a divorce decree that says, what are the terms of the of the divorce. And in my divorce decree, it was determined that I would pay my ex-wife a certain amount of money for her portion of what we owned jointly, house and otherwise. And it was a large sum of money. Stay with me. I came into the courtroom right downtown Richland County Court had a date set when the money and the check was supposed to be given to the judge. I ain't had one dime of it. Okay, I'm going to rewind. I didn't have one dime, Chris, of that money. It was several thousands of dollars. The judge looked at me because They will remind me where he claimed he ain't got no money, but he's riding in a good car. Here you go. Here you go. She said, tell you what, Dr. Ross, since you have not fulfilled this divorce decree, you're going to be remanded, and we're going to take you behind this courthouse, behind this judge chamber. I didn't know they had nothing back there, but they had a jail cell back there behind the judge. (laughs) Do you not know? They took me back there and they locked me back. At that time, I'm crying, you know, I'm crying like, I ain't never been locked up before. Never. Shut the door on me, the jail cell door on me, and the deputy who took me back there said, I got to confiscate your phone. I said, man, please. I need my phone. He said, now, you can't keep your phone. I said, let me make one phone call. (laughs) And since I've gone and only made one phone call, you know who I'm about to call. (laughs) You, you know who I call? John L. Scott. John said, hold on, doc. He said, what you say, doc? He said, I got this. What's the name of the judge? I told him the name of the judge. John said, I didn't take care of this. Do you not know? (laughs) Then in less than a couple of hours, John had got all that money together. Every dime of it. I started to tell you how much it was. Most of it and much of it was his own personal money brought it to the courthouse. They unlocked the door and let me out. He brought it to the courthouse. They unlocked the door and let me out because of John Scott. John, I don't know if you even knew about it, but I'm trying to tell you now. I'm trying to tell you. That's what he did for me. That's what he did for me. And never brought it up again. Did you hear what I just told you? Never brought it up again. John Scott has been giving to me. And even after I went through my divorce, John Scott, John Scott, Curtis Fry, and Wilma Fry took me out to eat every week. Because they knew I didn't cook. They took me out to eat every week and fed me. I'm trying to tell you, the man lived up to the meaning of his name. He was gracious in his giving. 
the last conversation we had in my office two weeks ago or three weeks ago, he said, Doc, Joan and I regret we wasn't here for your birthday. Pulled a $100 bill out of his pocket and said, Happy birthday, Doc. That's the last time we talked to each other. He was that kind of guy who just always was giving. I've been receiving from him all these years. He's going to be missed as a remarkable man. I thank God that I got to know him. He left me too soon. He didn't give me a chance to say goodbye. Joan, I, I've been thinking about that all week long. That he didn't give me a chance to say thank you one more time for being such a kind and gracious man. But I can't end it like this. Because I am a black Baptist preacher, you see. <laughs> and I can't end it like this. Because you see, the text that I read is about another man. Did you hear me? I said, the text is about another man. His name was not John, but it began with a J. Somebody know what I'm talking about. This man is the ultimate go-to man. Have mercy, somebody. And this is the man that John know, knew before I even met John. He was John the go-to man. Did you hear what I just said? I said, uh, this man who began, the name began with a J also, <laughs> happens to be the man uh, that John been going to all of his life. Oh Lord, uh, and uh, this man uh, begins with a J. Now I got to give you a pop quiz right quick. Because there's some people who might not, uh, are stretching their head talking about who is this man? whose name began with a J. Now you only get one chance to tell me what his name is. Can I get anybody out there can tell me what this man's name is? His name is Jesus. Am I right about it? And yes, he is a reliable man. Yes, he is a resourceful man. And yes, he is a remarkable man. But I got to add one more thing because what distinguishes him from John is that he's more than that. He is our redeemer. Aren't you glad about it? John cannot redeem nobody. John could not die for anybody's sin. But Jesus did. I thank God today that he died as our redeemer. Thank God today uh, you can go to him if your soul is lost. And Jesus will uh, offer you salvation. Am I right about it? I'm going to leave you when I tell you about what the old preacher used to say. When Jesus mm -hmm, had been buried in the tomb. Oh Lord, and Satan was having a, a celebration party that they had to crucify Jesus and he was buried in the tomb. He went to old man death and said, can you hold Jesus? Can you keep him in the, in the grave? And death said, I got him. Did you hear me? They said, I got him. He said, don't you know I still got Abraham? Don't you know I still got Moses? I still got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. I still got all of them. I got him. Satan was smiling as he walked away. He said, I'll see you tomorrow to see if Jesus is still here. He went back the next day and the deaf old man there said, yeah, I still got him. Did you hear me? And 
Satan began to storm his fist up at God the Father and said, see, I got your son. I got your son, Jesus. Have mercy in here. Now, Satan said, now, you got to really hold him on the third day because he told his disciple that on the third day morning, he's going to get up out of the grave. The dead old man there said, I got him. I still got Moses and everybody else. I got him. So Satan went back the third day talking to old man death. Old man death said, I was doing all right until around six o'clock this morning. Something started happening. Something started shaking and moving. He got a surge of power from somewhere and he got up out of here early this morning. Is there anybody in here? No, he got up early this morning. Got up early that morning with all power in his hand. Thank God he lives. Do you know he lives? Do you know he's your redeemer? In the all right. Yes! Yes! Ah! go-to man. John was my go-to man. But Jesus was both of our go-to men. And that's who you need in your life. You need Jesus. John, we'll see him again on the other side. Mabel, we'll see him again. Linda, we'll see him again. Alma, we'll see him again. Craig and Stanley and John, John, we'll see him again. And Mama Gracie, We'll see him again. Goodbye, John. Farewell for now. But one of these mornings, when this life is over, I shall fly away and be at rest. Put your hand together and give him praise. I'm through. God bless you.